consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the What is Asia podcast. I'm your host, Nakota Defonzo. On this episode of the What is Asia podcast, I'm going to be talking with Wad El Amin. She's a uh, master's student at the University of Oxford. And what she focuses on in her research is how issues of gender and notions of equality have changed in the rhetoric of Chinese leaders, uh, beginning with Mao and her research and going all the way to Xi Jinping. She's going to be talking about the evolution of this rhetoric and also how uh, the rhetoric uh, compares and contrasts with what's happening in practice on the ground uh, in the lives of real Chinese women. And uh, Wad, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure to join you. Yeah. So uh, I gave a quick cursory look at what you're studying, but can you go into a little bit more of the specifics? What exactly are you looking at in terms of the issue of gender in China? So at Oxford University, so as part of my major thesis, I'm looking more into the idea of gender equality and inequality in China. So um, more specifically about whether um, Mao Zedong's ideology of gender equality has remained the same in contemporary China today um, under the leadership of Xi Jinping, um, because both of them have kind of stated the same idea of men and women being equal. Um, but my thesis kind of analyzes whether that claim is actually true or not in that general aspect. Mm. And so um, there's an important point that you make um, in the information, at least that you shared with me, which is that there's a notable shift between not only Mao's idea and Xi Jinping's idea, but there's a notable shift uh, between that of Mao and Deng Xiaoping. So can you first start by telling people what were Mao's ideas of gender? And um, perhaps this might relate uh, quite closely with um, the chronology of the Cultural Revolution, but what were some of his ideas to give people that, that, that general overview? Yeah, so before like 1949, so before Mao Zedong actually became in power in China, um, there was actually the feudalistic idea of that men were seen as higher than women in all aspects of life, so family life, work, education, uh, etc. So after Mao Zedong came into power in 1949, he kind of brought the idea of like um, that men and women should be seen as equal in order to build like a socialist country. So he actually abolished um, like arranged marriages and actually put out a quote that in all aspects of life, so if I specifically, so in work, education, social, uh, cultural, and also something else that I don't remember, um, yeah. in that aspect, in those five aspects um, that men and women would be seen as equal. Um, so he stated that, uh, instead of women staying at home and working and taking care of the children only, um, that they should actually be put at the forefront um, with the men and actually work together, um, both physically um, and also care for the children at home. Um, so more of the specific ideas is, like you said, during the Cultural Revolution, um, where Mao Zedong basically stated that because China was so far behind economically and also um, socially compared to all other Western countries like the UK um, and the US. He actually came up with the idea that um, if men and women work together um, to build a socialist country, um, China could beat the US and the UK within 15 years, um, only if they would work together. So uh, he came up with the idea that during the Cultural Revolution, women should basically be stripped from all their feministic like features so um, their hair should be chopped off like really short 
um, they should not wear dresses, they should wear the same uniform and attire as men. Um, so basically, in Mao Zedong's eyes, even though he said men and women are actually equal, he basically meant both socially and also physically that men should actually look like women. So um, women should actually have like big muscles and should train the same as men. Um, so in that aspect, uh, men and women were actually seen completely as equal uh, mm -hmm. in Mao Zedong's era. Yeah, not only that, when they were sent to the countryside, yeah, uh, many of exactly. these people, women were expected to do just the same level of physical labor as that of men. Uh, I want to I want to just um, put something in brackets here so that people don't get the wrong yeah. impression. Um, there were equal rights movements going as far back as the late Qing. Um, as, for example, Dorothy Co will note, there were... Um, uh, protests against foot binding, for instance. Yeah. And uh, the Guomindang also had their own notions of gender uh, in their own uh, political thought. And women were working in factories and uh, earning a living uh, even during the Republican era. But specifically, as it sounds like you're saying, Mao believed that China wasn't doing enough to create this equality. And so he sort of went to this very extreme notion of, of equality, as you said, in, in terms of making uh, men and women look the same, dress the same, etc. cetera. Um, one thing that I noticed in, in the information that you provided me is you, you um, make this note about Deng Xiaoping, about uh, that maybe he sort of abandoned this uh, quest for gender equality a little bit. What exactly do you mean by that? So that's something I'm looking into specifically as well in my thesis. So after Mao Zedong passed away um, and after his regime kind of fell apart in 1978 um, and Deng Xiaoping came into power later on, he basically wanted to get rid of all the Maoist ideologies and the main ideology back again in Mao Zedong's era was men and women are equal and also the specific quote of when women uphold half the sky um, he wanted to get rid of that and build the country at a slower fate like a slower pace um, especially like you said during the cultural revolution and also the great leap forward um, because as they try to build the country in less than a few years so in less than five years they were like oh we can definitely um, beat the US or beat the UK in terms of economics, economical aspects. Um, so basically they leaped um, stages, like specific important stages. So the Deng Xiaoping especially said, okay, we have to get rid of how Mao Zedong actually thought about working fast, but not effectively. We have to go back to the steps that we actually missed during the Mao Zedong era. So he actually said, okay, we actually need to look more into our families or we look, we need to look more into our political life rather than looking only at like economics. But that is kind of controversial as well because when Deng Xiaoping came into power, he actually established that we should build our country based on um, their economic need or like the people's economic needs. So it's kind of like a shift from a socialist uh, pursue of the country to more of an economic pursuit of the country. Um, and in that aspect, uh, Deng Xiaoping was like, okay, since everyone was basically seeing Mao Zedong as like a god and always carrying around this little small red book of Mao Zedong, yeah. he was like, no, uh, we need to get rid of his ideology completely from the core, um, especially the idea of men and women are equal because he said that a country that needs to a country if a country wants to be successful it needs to be led by men um, therefore that kind of brings back the feudalist like hierarchy of women need needed to go back like they need to go back into their houses and like solely only look after the children um, and they have no place within politics no place in the work environment with men they can serve men um, and be part uh, of their karaoke nights or be part of their social nights but not be part of the decision making of the country 
Um, so I, I have a question about that because, um, you know, Deng Xiaoping was obviously greatly aware that China had um, stumbled economically, not only during the Great Leap Forward, but during the Cultural Revolution. Um, and in his view, this put him dramatically behind the West in terms of economic, industrial, and technological power. And so this is why he, he you know, Gaigo Kaifeng opened up yeah. and reformed. Um, I, I didn't know about that thing that he said where, um, you know, he said men need to, to lead the charge. But it seems to me that through the reform and opening up, this created a number of, uh, uh, you know, jobs and, and more occupational opportunities. So in practice, didn't his reform and opening up actually create more opportunities for women to get work and uh, sort of climb up the social and economic ladder? Or is that not what happened? From my point of view and from all the like journals that I've read, I do agree that this like the opening up um, to all the other countries has actually given China like has given China a lot of opportunities, but mostly men, um, especially within the business area. So in the Mao Zedong area, especially women were actually given higher positions, um, the same as men, and sometimes even higher. Than men themselves because Mao Zedong thought that women were more thoughtful and could make better decisions than men. Uh, whereas Deng Xiaoping uh, in particular thought more about uh, men would know the, like more uh, in terms of the business aspects, whereas women would know more about the social aspects and the social needs and care of children. So with the social, with the opening and reform era, in the aspects of uh, nutritional care, and in the aspects of education, women actually did surpass men. And especially during the 19, like during 1982, um, there were more women enrolled in education than men. Um, and those were many opportunities given by uh, also the feminist movements that were happening in other countries. And because of the foreign influences, like the feminist movements happening in Thailand and also in Vietnam during that time, um, women were more empowered um, in that aspect, um, to care more and be more proud of them being at home rather than being ashamed of not being able to help build the country. But in terms of other aspects, I would say that men were given more opportunities and more of a higher social status than women, because again, that feudalistic hierarchy so like idea was brought back. Um, and also the one-child policy was implemented during that time as well. So again, that kind of withheld women as well, uh, because again, people were only conceiving one child, were only having one child. So men were going to work to provide and get the best resources for that one child. And then Deng Xiaoping's ideology and Deng Xiaoping's idea was more like, okay, since we can only have one child, we need to have like, the mother should give the best care to the child. I should only pay all our attention and focus to that one child. So she should not necessarily go out of the house and also pursue like something else besides being a at home wife or like a housewife, but instead just fully focus her care on their one child in that mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Um, in your thesis, you, uh, you know, source three main leaders, that being Mao, Deng Xiaoping, and then the final one being Xi Jinping. Why, why do you jump directly to him? I mean, um, you know, you don't look at, for example, uh, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and their ideas, but you jump directly to Xi Jinping. What, what was your uh, thought process behind that? I think it was mostly based on... Um again, because Xi Jinping is more, is the current leader and also in contemporary China. Um, Xi Jinping was actually one of the latest leaders to actually quote Mao Zedong's ideology specifically. So um, Xi Jinping actually said in 2015, 2017, and even in 2020, that 
uh, women of all have the sky um, and it was like directly quoted from Mao Zedong um, and reading articles about that made me jump from Deng Xiaoping into Xi Jinping directly. Also uh, in regards to Jiang Zemin, from Deng Xiaoping's era because Mao Zedong's ideologies were slowly disappearing during his era and during his time uh, and his regime, like his time in power, there wasn't much going on or there, was, there wasn't much change from his time and uh, Deng Xiaoping's time. So it kind of remained the same, like women's states in society remained mostly the same. There wasn't actually much of a difference. Mm -hmm. So certainly Xi Jinping isn't just echoing Mao. I'm sure he has his own unique ideas. So yeah. what is this blend of Mao's thought look like in conjunction with Xi Jinping's thought in terms of his speeches, in terms of what he's saying specifically about the policies that he wants to put in place moving forward. Yeah, so that is actually what I found really interesting and what made me actually focus on these two people specifically in my thesis, Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping. It's because, again, because um, Xi Jinping actually directly quoted Xi, uh, Mao Zedong of women uphold half the sky, but also that he said in those five aspects that Mao Zedong believed that women should be equal uh, as men or equal to men. Um, Xi Jinping actually said the same thing. So he actually stated that we should cater to women's needs. Um, we should give them the same equal rights as men in politics, work, social life, cultural and family life. So those five aspects. And when I did some research into this, there were many articles that were actually uh, comparing those two and also not looking directly into what speeches they said. So as part of my thesis, I'm also doing like textual analysis of their speeches. And one thing that was really interesting that came out of that was the words that came out that was used the most by both of them was that uh, women and men are equal, uh, women and pol like political life uh, should be equal, um, and basically the the words used the most for women equality, men, uh, and inequality. So basically, they both established that there was uh, that, that there was inequality between men and women. So in order to I guess get rid of this inequality or I guess less than this inequality. Um, they have to get to the needs of women. But the, the main difference that I found specifically like the was that was catering to women's needs based on men's needs. So basically it's physically um, an appearance by changing women into men or making them look Men and giving them, I guess, the rest is men, all men's ideas. Whereas she's thinking, I know it's a woman's historically, so especially in the COVID 19 situation, um, women are seen as more vulnerable in China um, because they're taking care of children, um, they need more care of children. Xi Jinping believes that instead of women feel like feminine characteristics we should pay to more to their needs rather than physically and I guess mentally changing them as men. So those are the two differences between them. Right. So one thing that strikes me in particular about something that you said is he he seems to be adamant about getting women more involved in political life. You know, one thing that's kind of interesting, and I don't know if you've had the chance to uh, maybe talk to or interview some people for your study, but, you know, because my ME thesis dealt with, in part with gender. And so it was something that I spent a lot of time thinking about myself while, while I was in, in Xiamen. Um, I asked a number of uh, women who, I, who I'd known at the school, I said, do you think that... Um, at some point, there's going to be a um, a female general secretary of the Communist Party, and a hundred percent. And I had to have asked maybe 
you know, 15, 20 women at, at the university this question. And they all said yes. And the next question I asked them was, um, do you think it's going, do you think someone from our generation is going to be that person? And interestingly, most of them said, uh, no, most of them said it's going to be someone from our children's generation. Um, I don't know if you've been able to talk to, uh, anyone and ask them more about, uh, women in political life. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know if you've, you've had any of those conversations. I did have some conversations uh, with some of the lecturers um, at my old university um, regarding this. Um, but one thing, I think similar to what you said, they said not in their generation that they would say they would see more female politicians of higher, I guess, rank or higher level um, in the Chinese Communist Party, but which was also interesting, which came out uh, I guess a few months ago was that even though Xi Jinping said that he was striving for like gender equality within, especially in the political life, and that there is actually gender equality within the Chinese Communist Party right now, and that they have a high number of Chinese female politicians, it came out in the reports that this is actually false, uh, also controversial, because it came out that actually only 12% of the Chinese Communist Party was female, um, and none of them were of higher ranks. I think only one or two of them were, I guess, mid-ranked in the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but other than that, uh, all the claims that Xi Jinping has stated before, since 2012, um, in which he stated that, again, we are striving really hard to create like a gender-balanced like balanced political party. There is still little evidence for little um, I guess we're in that area. Um, so personally, I do think that maybe not in this generation, um, there would be a high, higher level politician that is female uh, in the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, I, I, I think what's interesting when we look at, um, you know, because obviously both you and I have, have been to China and lived in China. I think it's interesting to look at this contrast between what's being said in the political realm versus, versus what is actually happening on the ground in practice. Um, because in your research, you a lot of your data seems to be sourced from uh, speeches by Xi Jinping. Um, you also look at data from the Women's Federation. Um, and you know, one thing that came to my mind when I thought about this is obviously it's a little bit problematic to source data from the Women's Federation mm -hmm. because it's just an extension of the CCP. It's not mm -hmm. an independent organization. So it, it seems to me like what a lot of your research deals with is uh, the aspirations of the CCP rather than mm -hmm. uh, maybe the the practical uh, aspects of, of their policy on, on the ground. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, but I think uh, which I tr what what you said is accurate. I think the Women's Federation is basically an extended part of the CCP, and um, all of the data that they've provided actually aligns with everything the CCP has ever stated or what Xi Jinping has ever stated. But then there were also reports that were leaked uh, several years ago, and which I found my way into obtaining. Um, so when I compare those two, there's like a drastic difference and there's like a significant uh, piece of information left out in the Women's Federation, like documents that were seen in other documents, for example, um, that again, that in the political uh, sphere and the political area that again, there is a much lower number of women, but also in the work life, like in the working environment, the CCP has stated that over 64% of Chinese women are actually working outside the house and working um, like uh, the same job as men and earning the same amount of women, but comparing it to other documents which, are, which have been released by the WHO, um, which have been released by other resources online, uh, which basically state that there is actually less than 23% of women that earn the same amount of men or even lower. Uh, so again, that all, all these data sources contradict 
each other. Um, yeah, it's, I'm trying to think about how to, how to formulate what, what to say next. Um, it, it's interesting that, you know, you know, because in some sense, I mean, it is, you know, a, uh, you know, propaganda mission, but it's in a lot of ways, it's a positive propaganda mission because they are trying to promote uh, more women coming in, into the workplace uh, and, and getting into political life. Um, we've contrasted this aspiration with reality, but is there any evidence in your research that suggests that this, um, these missions on the part of the CCP are actually having an effect to inspire more women to get out there? Like, I, again, I don't know if you've done interviews with people or whatnot, but um, do women actually take these, uh, effectively these propaganda pieces, do they take them to heart? And does that actually inspire them and motivate them to actually, um, uh, be more assertive in getting out into public life? Yeah, um, I have not had the opportunity to interview anyone uh, due to the COVID-19 situation, but there have been um, reports and also I think it was on the news um, several months ago, I'm not sure if you're aware that um, there were actually women protests happening in China whereby a lot of women were actually arrested for stating their needs and stating what they wanted the CCP to do. But instead of the CCP actually uh, listening specifically what these women were stating, they were basically all, well, five women specifically were arrested. Um, so um, this caught the attention of Western media and got blown out of proportion where it basically stated that, okay, even though um, Xi Jinping has attended the like the all women's federation uh, committee and also the 2017 um, women's rights I guess conference where he stated again that he will always listen well not always he will listen to what women has, have to say and what their needs are yet again his actions don't actually align with what he said because um those arrests that he made of women stating or women marching down the streets of Shanghai and Beidou, um, to say what they wanted. Um, yet again, he just shut them down because they, again, did not align with what the CCP was saying um, and did not align what the CCP was hoping uh, what women would bring to the country. Um, therefore, they literally just shut it down. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that aspect, Again, it kind of seems as if if the women's needs or women's rights, even even though they say to out vocally, if they do not align with, with the CCP's, um, I guess, agenda, um, they either get shut down or they just get uh, like put aside in that sense. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I have two more questions. One of which is, is there anything that you... Uh, maybe felt like I should have asked that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask, uh, like any other aspect of your research? Mm, aspects of my research. Um, no, I think that is mostly it. Okay. I think as I'm still still researching into my thesis and also like more information, more recent information, because um, Xi Jinping actually did a speech um, in the like 2021 recently in January regarding again women's rights and uh, gender equality in China. Um, so I feel like maybe looking into that might bring some more new ideas that I can bring into my thesis, um, which may make a difference but I think maybe one thing is that um, Ma, Xi Jinping actually does not want to be seen as the new Mao Zedong. A no, lot of people, not. <laughs> yeah. So with him actually quoting uh, women uphold half the sky, uh, the specific sentence that was actually set out uh, and that was the major slogan of Mao Zedong uh, for Xi Jinping to actually say that in public 
a lot of people have said that he's basically trying to be the next Mao Zedong without being Mao Zedong. Uh, yeah, I, I think he's trying to, only in the sense that he's trying to inspire an energy that yeah. surrounded Mao during his tenure as chairman. Yeah, and also a lot of people have stated that it is one way to also sway the older generation to give them more of this sense of nostalgia um, because a lot of the people from the elder like generation in China right now have experienced the Mao Zedong era, um, maybe have to even taken part um, during that time, have gone down to the countryside, um, but at a very, very young age. So for, Mao, for Xi Jinping to state one of the key slogans that were so major and actually plastered everywhere um, in China during that time, during Mao Zedong's era, would kind of bring out this sense of nostalgia and not only sway the younger generation uh, of women, but also um, give the women back then, like the younger women, the younger children um, who were female back then, the sense again that they could be more than just a housewife, that they could be more than just the, the caretaker of the home. Um, they could be, again, the same women um, as, their, as their mothers um, back in Mao Zedong's era and help to build China in that sense. Um, I guess my, my last question here is what uh, books would you recommend people to read if uh, after watching this podcast episode, they say, oh, I want to read more about this. Um, if you could just recommend maybe like one or two or three books. Yeah, um, a few books. There are actually many books that are out. Um, um, but one book that I would recommend, uh, recommend is, um, or a few books by this particular author, um, is also uh, a lecture at my university by Rachel Murthy. Um, she has several books regarding the Mao Zedong era and especially gender equality, um, gender inequality. Um, but I would actually recommend a movie um, if someone would like to know more about um, gender equality and I guess gender as a whole uh, in the Mao Zedong era specifically, which is the Red Detachment of Women, which is also something I would look into uh, in my thesis, because um, it basically shows you how women uh, were in the feudalist era and how women were basically taken out of their houses and actually uh, seen as equal during the Mao Zedong era. So the movie plays out um, from beginning of 1949 all the way until the end of the Cultural Revolution. And then you see, I guess, the slow process of how women become physically and mentally equal to men um, is what I would recommend. Uh, yeah, yeah let me let me throw let me throw a couple of books in there myself because yeah. I'm I'm fairly familiar with the the literature on gender in China. Uh, one book is To the Storm, uh, yeah. and that's about a uh, professor who uh, she was working at Beida during the Cultural Revolution, and then another is uh, Red Azalea. That's also another very good book. So, yeah. Well, cool. Um, that's going to do it for this episode of the What is Asia podcast. Um, for anyone that's interested, uh, you can go onto my YouTube channel to watch more videos, or you can go onto nakotadefonso.com, and we will see you in the next episode. All right, that's it. Let me just. Uh...